everybody, welcome to Ask Dr. Testosterone, starring Dr. George Tuliatos. Dr. Tuliatos is the author of Bodybuilding, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. You can get that on his website, gtool.com, G-T-O-U-L.com, also available on uh, Amazon.com. Dr. Tuliatos also contributes every month to Muscular Development Magazine. He's also been a contributor to William Llewellyn's Anabolics and many other magazines and books. Welcome from Athens, Greece, Dr. George Tuliatos. Hey, doctor. Hello, Ron. I'm glad because I just received on uh, Saturday the June's issue with uh, Callum on the front uh, cover. Yeah. And it was, uh, yes, it was the June's issue. It was the first time I received it so early before even uh, it comes, it arrives in Greece. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're looking now for uh, August because it's going to be my interview over there. Right. Uh, did you have any news about uh, what happened to uh, Matt Porter? Yeah, very, very sad. I, I believe he was only about 36 years old. He has a very young son. I didn't know him well. I had a few conversations with him a couple times in person, a couple times, uh, you know, messaging online. Really good guy. Everybody loved Matt. Very knowledgeable, he the, humble. Mm. He owned a supplement company, right? Yes, MPA, MPA approved supplements. All right, Matt Porter approved. MPA was an, is the company name. So his wife. It was, it was a knife pro. Uh, he What's didn't. Him? No, he didn't turn pro. He was top five in the USA once, I believe. He was, you know, uh, you know, very very impressive physique, massive upper body, uh, you know, shoulders and arms in particular were super impressive. Uh, but you know, like a lot of people, never didn't quite get the pro car, but decided to put all his energy into coaching people and a supplement line, which typically is the very the smarter thing to do because you know trying to turn pro and most pros don't really make a living at the sport it's it's things outside the sport but uh, very very sad and, yeah, so yeah. Uh, I, I know you and uh I, i'd love for you had an idea for you and dr o'connor yes yes to do share my thoughts and uh, same happened two years ago with dallas and rich and uh, it's sad and uh, I remember the video of the, the autopsy results of Dallas and Rich, and it was a, a massive uh, breakthrough of uh, Thomas O'Connor. Yeah. And I shared my thoughts with him also. It was, uh, was before the, the shows. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, this is the, the ugly, this is, I mean, this is the bad side of the bodybuilding that I explain in my book. Mm, yeah, the ugly side. Sport, yes, it's an extreme sport, and... Uh, well, it's very hard. I, I look forward to you and O'Connor. It's gonna. We'll have to coordinate. You guys are very busy. We'll, we got to coordinate something where you can both comment at the same time because he was under. I don't know if it would even be maybe medical malpractice uh, because he was diagnosed with uh, very high blood pressure, but they didn't give him any medication for it, so it went untreated. And uh, you know, it just seems like, blood hmm? pressure is a fact in bodybuilding because of the steroids and because of the stimulants yeah. and because of the lifting weights, the heart adapts and becomes thicker, and then everything flows. And you have to to make certain adjustments and uh, be very cautious yeah. because the uh, blood pressure is a silent killer. Yeah, and I mean, just the fact that you know, so many guys. I've heard of many other stories of bodybuilders with high blood pressure that it was either undiagnosed or they didn't treat it and it's uh, it's you guys will get into it much more deeply but I believe it's the it's the kidneys that take a real beating too when you have high blood pressure am I right? Yes and uh, the glomerular filtration I mean the, the glomerulus uh, breaks down hmm. uh, practically yeah. but if you smoke it becomes worse because if you smoke the arteries becomes uh, more rigid. Hardened arteries. Hmm. Yeah, I had arteries, the, the so-called atherosclerosis. Right. And then if you squat 400 pounds, then you, you may blow and have a stroke, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've heard stories about guys having strokes in the gym. That's scary, really scary. Uh, okay, heart attacks too. Uh, let's get into your questions because the questions keep pouring in. Your, your viewers, they want answers. So here we go. Uh, here's a nutrition question because you do know a lot about nutrition as well. So number one is to free form amino acids. What, first of all, what a free form? Because I, I think that's an old school term. It's all I ever hear: are branch chain and essentials. What's free form? Well, the free form um, is called is, is written down L L. Hmm. Oh, like L tryptophan, L valine. L glutamine, for instance, is the free form of the amino acid that occurs 
Now, uh, I take a little bit of uh, research that I had, and now three forms of amino acids can be ingested separately, like you use uh, glutamine, you use arginine, you can use also leucine, but you can use also BCAs. Nowadays, we use essential amino acids, the one that the novel cannot be synthesized by the organisms in the body. Right. Therefore, we use them, and they are the most significant uh, chain of amino acids that we need to synthesize uh, skeletal muscle. Okay. So the question, uh, let me get to the guy's questions because you'll have a good answer for this. He wants to know, do free-form amino acids have to be taken by themselves? I'm confused. They're often mixed together, but I also hear they compete with one another for absorption. I don't think so. I mean, we have the, the, the 10 essential amino acids that also BCAs are included hmm. and they can be ingested at once. But also we have the 20 sequence of amino acids within the whey protein, for instance. Yeah. And actually, as a matter of fact, uh, whey hydrolysate, that means it's practically the same as you ingest uh, amino acids separately. Hmm. So the whey protein hydrolysate is pre-digested, is the one that uh, highly absorbed and utilized. Hmm. Uh, very fast. So, uh, mainly the whey protein hydrolysis said is for recuperation right after the training. It's not something like for a meal for recover or something. That your muscles are thirsty and they want the amino acids for recovery and repair tissue. Okay. Now, it's the same as when you ingest, ingest um, uh, separate glutamine, but apparently you can use much more glutamine separately than in a formula of essential amino acids or within a whey protein. Yeah. But the utilization is the same. As a matter of fact, uh, I had a little bit of research and they said that whey protein hydrolysates brings higher concentration of uh, amino acids in the blood serum uh, related to the amino acid taken separately. Okay, which is good to hear because if you had to take them all separately, that would be a chore. You'd spend mm -hmm. all day taking one, then you got to wait an hour to take another one. That would be ridiculous. Okay, uh, here's another one. Uh, I never heard of this substance at all. I, I hear all this research on nicotin, nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside yes. as a new anti-aging substance. They mentioned that it stops IGF-1 production and ele elevated IGF-1 is a leading cause in aging. Is this true? Now, nicotinamide is uh, like niacin, vitamin B3. Hmm. We use niacin in bodybuilding in order to raise HDL the good cholesterol that also is elevated by low pace cardiovascular exercise, yeah. by quit smoking, by some uh, substances like red rice yeast, by essential fatty acids, by fiber, by avoiding saturated fat and trans fat, and also by, as I told you, um, skipping, uh, avoiding uh, smoking. Now, niacin <clears throat> uh, is also responsible for autophagy. Autophagy is is uh, a, re a process that occurs when uh, fasting occurs, and practically means that the the cell digests itself, hmm. and this is this is um, is closer to longevity because um, autophagy and fasting elevate AMPK, which is a protein that it's linked to longevity, while IGF-1 and mTOR are linked with muscle growth, but actually with cancer as well. Hmm. Wow. Therefore, yes, niacin, we can uh, presume that it's also linked with uh, uh, longevity because, and age management, because it uh, supports autophagy. Now, autophagy uh, happens when the, the, the self goes under starvation and actually eats itself. Hmm. And uh, yes, this happens under intermediate fasting and restriction of calories. Hmm. Okay. Therefore, yes, uh, you can assume that uh, niacin can help, but uh, frankly, it was the first time that I, I learned something like that. It was not uh, the hardcore uh, material for longevity or for, you know, as the antioxidants and other elements as well. Right. Hmm. I use niacin, yes, with meals in order to elevate my HDL. Okay. It elevates a little bit, 10%, but also gives you flushing and this is an allergic reaction induced by prostaglandins. So what's the dosage that you take with each meal, doctor? 100, 100 milligrams. Okay. So about a half a gram a day. Okay. 
Next question, please ask the doctor to clarify his statements about using oral steroids sublingually. It sounds like at one point he says that the injectable oral, side note, what is the difference between injectable and oral Winstrol and Anadrol? Is this what he said or can you use any oral steroid sublingually? Also can you use it as a raw powder or can only tablets be used sublingually? My guess is it wouldn't matter. I'd also like to know if, I, if you have raw powders of injectables, such as test propionate or trenbolone acetate, could those be used sublingually rather than being brewed up into oil solutions? Wow, that'd be a, that'd be a weird thing. Now, when I said about sublingual use, what I mean, that <clears throat> when you use something sublingually, uh, it, re it reaches the tiny capillary network under the tongue, hmm. and therefore is uh, abruptly absorbed, unlike it was digested under the stomach and then go to in the intestinal tract system and then absorb from the small intestine from the portal vein and from the portal vein goes into the liver. Mm -hmm. So in this way, when you use something sublingually that also resembles when, we, when you have a heart attack, you usually use nitroglycerin under the tongue. Why under the tongue? Because it's faster absorbed under the capillary network. So if we use the, the, either the powder, so we smash the tablet yeah. and we let it uh, be in a powder form or we let it dissolve with the saliva under the tongue. Hmm. It resembles the intramuscular injection oh. because it gets directly into the bloodstream as it was injected. Hmm. Unlikely if we swallow it and goes through the other way as I told you yeah. through the vein. Now the first entrance goes one time through the liver. The, the other, the old-fashioned way by swallowing them uh, passes twice. Therefore, the stress is a little bit higher. Now, I can explain this by answering the question, which is more hepatotoxic, oral winsor or injectable? It's the oral. Mm. It's the same stamps, the same milligrams, but the way of administration plays a role. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Um, so this guy, apparently, he's, maybe he can get raw powder because, you know, the only people I know that can get raw powder... Initially, the steroids come in powder, and then they fix them up with, uh, you know oils or uh, whatever if it's water-based yeah now i'm not sure if i can get tremble on powder i'm not a chemist well if you could i'm just saying if this guy it sounds like this guy can get tremble on powder could you could you use tremble on powder under the tongue i'm not sure about tremble or back i can i can speak about winstrol stenozolo yeah or about uh oxandrol or anavar or all the 17 alkylated pills oh. So but it, actually, M3 methyl trienolone is supposed to be a derivative of, tre of trembolone. Okay. And uh, yes, this is a 17 alkylated that it was uh, orally, of course, used. Yeah. And uh, yes, myself, whenever I use 17 alkylated, I, I, I do this this procedure, and never never do it. Uh, um, I mean, I, I try to split the dose. Mm. I try to split the dose three times a day. And not instead of one large dose once a day. Yeah, that makes sense. It comes, it, it comes less stress to the liver, but also according to the half life. Right. So, so if someone's taking sixty milligrams of Dianabol a day, three of twenty, three of twenty, yes, three of twenty would be much better than sixty all at once. <laughs> yes, yes, true, no okay. doubt. All right, but just to be clear, it, this powder—if if somebody can get powder, it's only going to work if it's a seventeen alkylated steroid. You know, test if you have sustenon powder or something. So for instance, uh, Proviron, I don't use it sublingually. There's no, no, there's no need of it. Okay, gotcha. Uh, next question for you: Does resveratrol, resveratrol extract supplement, inhibit IGF-1 binding? I also heard it selectively inhibits IGF-1 binding only in the intestines. If that's true, it's amazing. Are either of these claims true? Now, resveratrol is a polyphenol, and it's a is a is a potent antioxidant. It comes from the grape seed, from red grapes, but also from uh, blueberries. Oh, okay. And it's uh, cardiovascular protective. It can lower and uh, LDL. It can elevate HDL. And also, resveratrol is uh, very promising in cancer because it uh, suppresses cellular proliferation. Therefore, it can against it can act against the fundamental basis of cancer, which is cellular growth hmm. and proliferation. In this way, yes, it can. we can say that it can uh, limit IGF-1 because IGF-1 and cancer are directly linked. 
Therefore, if it's supposed to uh, suppress cellular proliferation and be helpful in cancer, it can, we can say that it can limit the elevation of IGF-1. Hmm. Now, as far as I know, resveratrol also is a natural anti-estrogenic uh, uh, substance and supplement. Hmm. So, uh, yes, resveratrol in a, is a natural anti-estrogenic substance, but also, yes, it can be promising in cancer and uh, limit IGF-1. However, very low IGF-1 as well is linked with uh, um, with mortality, okay? Mm. But super high and super low as well. Therefore, it has to be optimized. Yeah. And uh, for instance, my grandmother, she's 104. Wow. Her IGF-1... 104, people, did you hear that? She's 104. <laughs> wow. Her IGF-1 is 100. Yeah. My IGF-1 is 190. Okay, so there is, as, as you uh, grow old, uh, it declines, okay? Mm -hmm. The point is, it gets below 100, is linked more with mortality. Mm -hmm. But super high HF1 also, it can link with, to, to cancer. I mean, in certain uh, cancers and tumors, the concentration of HF1 is pretty high. Mm -hmm. In lung cancer, in prostate cancer, in breast, in ovarian cancer. Therefore, uh, moderation is the key. Hmm. Wow. That's impressive, doctor. 104. You know, I'd say it one more time. <laughs> IGF-1 it gets boosted by growth hormone. Right. The more you use, the more it's uh, released from the liver. So legitimate growth hormone boosts IGF-1, super high. Which is not a good thing either. Well, it's good yes. for it's good for your muscles. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Bad if you want to live to be 104. You're probably not going to be 104. Uh, question about human growth hormone administration for long periods of time. I'm getting really bad carpal tunnel syndrome in my right hand more than my left. At different times of day, it's somewhat painful to grab things because I need I feel nerve constriction of some sort. I only use three I use on workout days plus ipamorelin and sermorelin, which are SARMs, right? Should I stop all the peptides or is there a supplement or drug out there that can counteract this pesky HGH carpal tunnel syndrome? Yeah, carpal tunnel syndrome is a classic... Uh phenomena, a symptom, a side effect of uh, long-term uh, growth hormone use. But also carpal tunnel can happen to those ladies that uh, print a lot and they use the mouse. So they have, they, what happens exactly is in our wrists, we have four tendons, superficial and, and four deep. Now these tendons like my fingers, but they are covered with um, a sheath. Now, this sheath gets inflamed and actually gets swollen because growth hormone is linked also with edema. Therefore, when, when these sheaths get swollen, the median nerve that passes within gets compressed. Hmm. So you have this aching in, in your wrist. Now, the, the, how you manage with this is you surgically, you cut off the transverse, um, um, I'm sorry, the transverse ligament. Yeah, and and then it's the you have the compression of median nerve. Hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so yes, a, this guy in order to to minimize this, he has to either lower the dose hmm. or use it day by day by day, every other day. Now he also uses sermorelin, which is a GHRP six, in order to kick his. Hypothesis for natural production, as we discussed before. Uh, I'm sorry, but the only way to manage this uh, purely is the surgical procedure. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I never heard of a supplement that's going to help carpal tunnel. You can use also non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Yeah. Uh, but this is temporary. Right. They're just masking the pain. Yeah, masking pain suppresses inflammation, but the problem initiates with uh, with the use of growth hormone. Yeah. Sorry, guy. Uh, here we go. I got a question regarding HCG. Dr. Tuliados has mentioned the daily use of HCG, HCG like 500 micrograms several times. In the Middle East where I live, we can only manage to buy 5,000 microgram vials, and there is no other option available regardless. Most of the guys prefer to use the whole vial, 5,000 I use, every five days during PCT for two or three weeks. First, how useful is this compared to low dose? say 500 IU administered daily. Second, is it scientifically okay to do the daily administration 
and just keep the rest of the reconstituted drug in the refrigerator because almost all the leaflet instructions insist that the whole dose, 5,000 IUs, should be used immediately after reconstitution or it will lose its potency. Mm. Now, we had the same issue here. Uh, first, we had the, uh, 15, uh, the 1,500 uh, ampules, 1,500, and then uh, we ran out of stock and then we had the 5,000 mm. IUs. Now, what I personally uh, used, it was the, the tiny dose of 100 IUs a day. 100? The five, 100. Yes, just 100, yes. The 500 is not every day, it's once a week, mm. okay? If you use more, for instance, 5,000, what happens is desensitize of the LH receptors in the body. Mm. So this is not good. Uh, it may also have a, a negative effect. Mm. Now, uh, usually uh, people tend to say that uh, pregnil or HCG can give you uh, water retention, edema, or maybe gynecomastia. This is not true for a peptide. I mean, a peptide from a chemical point of view does not aromatize. What happens is the HCG elevates endogenous testosterone production that it will eventually aromatize. Mm -hmm. So it absolutely it directly. Now, this guy, he has to, to suck, to draw the, the content of the 5,000 I use into a, an insulin syringe and then uh, inject once a week, one tenth of it, therefore 500 I use. Once a week. And then, uh, yes. And then put it in the fridge. The point is, you're going to use this uh, insulin series in 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure in 10 weeks if it's the same potency of the mixture. Hmm. Quick question uh, about that, because if you're using the same syringe 10 times, isn't it going to get pretty dull, the, uh, the needle? If you're poking it uh, into the skin 10 times? May I, I inject to the to the delta yeah, yeah, but yes, you're right about this. But it's no point of infection. You put it in the fridge where there are no microbes, okay. and you sterilize before and after. Uh, so I suggest this guy to. The, I don't think so. There is a problem with mixing and put it in the fridge because I, I did this for two years, and uh, it tripled my sperm. Therefore, it worked. It worked. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, we got a final question. This was a bonus round question. This is kind of important because opioid addiction is a massive problem here in the, UN, in the U.S. I don't know if Greece has a similar problem. Yes, yeah, me time. But we're yes. A lot of people here are, are uh, addicted to opiates and dying every day. So this guy is in methadone rehab. He says, I'm in methadone rehab and I'm on TRT. Uh, how would the methadone affect my TRT? Would it, would it have any impact on his testosterone levels? Now, all opiates, including coding, uh, heroin uh, or methadone, they, they lead to hypogonadism. They suppress HPTA. Mm. Therefore, we have a problem, and the problem initiates when you use uh, opiates, and then they also, of course, suppress the respiratory system. They lead to constipation, mm. but also they suppress endogenous testosterone production. Now, when, they, when this guy is introduced into TRT, the problem is solved, mm. apparently. You don't care because you use exogenous right. testosterone. Um, therefore, the problem would be uh, before you, he used TRT, and, and I guess he introduced himself to TRT because of this, mm. because of the supposed hypogonadism. Right. Okay. Um, now, would he? I mean, he's. I, I don't know if he's doing his own TRT or if he's doing it medically, but you know, if he's doing it through a legitimate doctor like Dr. O'Connor, they would monitor his test levels to make sure that he's in the optimum range because otherwise say if, if I'm a meth if I'm on methadone and it, which I'm not but if I'm on methadone and I'm using 200 milligrams a week of test you know would that maybe lower my test a little bit and I would need to use more testosterone or would it have no impact yes this is a good point and also um, method I think opiates makes you lethargic right yeah yeah so uh, testosterone, on the, on the other hand, makes you energetic because also it burns fat and energy comes out of this. Right. Therefore, it can, it can stabilize this energy defect and it can make you more vital, you know. Cool. All right. Well, those are all the questions, Dr. Tuliados. Do you remember, do you remember the Nubain and Paul the I never... He Nubain and then he, he switched to heroin. There was a lot of bodybuilders that were hooked on Nubain, a lot of bodybuilders, especially out in the L.A. area in the 90s. It was huge. He was, this was prescribed. Yeah, I don't know how they were getting it, doc, through doctors or black market, but, I mean, 
apparently like in, especially in the the body the, the top bodybuilders of that time especially out west a lot of them were using nubane for pain kill you know to they would take it before training so they would feel no pain then they take it later so they could relax and go to sleep i mean they were just, they were they were taking it all the time basically you know like yes. any it's an opiate right so it's, it's yes yes of course yes you know, when you're addicted same, to an opiate you have to be on it all the time yes elvis michael jackson and uh, heath ledger the three both the both of them died of opiate abuse mm, yeah yeah and uh, a lot of bodybuilders uh, I, I don't know of any any that actually died from it but a lot of them had serious problems with it mm. okay. Quadzilla, paul de mayo paul de mayo yeah he was one but he was just one of you know for every guy that talked about it uh and we knew about it. There's probably a thousand more that we that never talked about it. But anyway, yeah, it was it was a crazy thing because I've never, I never saw the stuff, but uh, I, I heard about it all the time. But you know, I had I had a, a a couple older sisters with opiate addiction, so I was not interested. Didn't want anything to do with it. Because I, I was also uh, I was also myself uh, introduced to codeine in order to um, mask my lower back pain and my hip joint pain. Mm. And, you know, from one side I was using codeine, 60 milligrams before to work out, and then I had to double my caffeine dose. Mm. And it's all messed up, you know. Yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah, I actually remember I did have one conversation with Paul DeMeo about this, and he compared it. He wasn't talking, he wasn't admitting it to about himself at the time, but now looking back I realize he was talking about himself. He says it's like Elvis. He had to take drugs to get up, to have the energy to do his performances, and then he had yes. to take a bunch of other drugs to come down and be able to go drug to sleep. Every day. Drug for the drug. Right. Some people were, were sleeping with uh, opiates and they were waking up with cocaine. Yeah. Yikes. What a mix. So, well, doctor, that is all the questions. Uh, we actually have more coming in every day because your viewers, they're loving the show. They're loving the knowledge and uh, advice and everything that you're providing for them. So everyone around the world is appreciating. We're getting questions from literally all around the world for you it's and they become harder every time <laughs> yeah i mean they're getting intricate but you know you have you, you i have to do a little research in some of them yeah i mean you i gotta let people know you you spend a lot of time you're busy with your own your own medical career but you take time you get the questions in advance and you do your research and you you always make sure you have the best answers for these people so yes, but also thanks to you and to alan golding and steve bletchman i have my international career which is something very important for me also cool thank you well, I because wanna, I, I tanked my, my career in Greece, and now I have to do it abroad. So for, and everybody, uh, Mr. Olympia is coming. Dr. Tuliatos yeah. is going to be there. Yeah. Yes. yes. So we'll, we'll have more details as we get closer to the show, everybody. But yeah. Dr. T. I think it's coming. I think Phil is coming. He starts his dieting. Eh? I believe Phil is going to do the show. I believe he will. I want him to do the show. You know? Until the very last time, he won't say, let's, just like Arnold in Sydney, 1980. I don't know if he'll be that. I don't know if he's going to wait he till the very last minute. But well, until the last time, he will. I, I, he'll I, be I, yeah, because it's. I love comebacks. Everybody loves a comeback, and he, you know, it'd be such a great story for him to come back and get his title back, just the way yeah, Cutler, I, Cutler did. I was in his speech that uh, people are expecting you. There's no interest in without you. Right. Come back and take what belongs to you. Yeah. Yeah, Phil wants that title back. Really. Even the hater, even the haters want Phil back. Well, you know what? <laughs> They wanted to see, people hated Phil. They thought he was arrogant or whatever, and they wanted to see him humbled. And he got beat last year, and that really... He became really, humble. He, he became on Darth with, huh? He did, because, you know, I've gotten to know him so much better this past year than I ever knew him, and I've known him for, geez. I, I, Losing is uh, more of a human. Yeah, I mean, he's he is human, but he's, he's not, he's more relatable. He's more, people can identify with him now more than he's been beaten, and he's, uh, he had his, he bleeds. his title. He bleeds. Going. Yeah, he'd bleed. He's, he's a person like everybody else. And yeah, I'd love to see him come back and win. It would be a great story. It'd be an awesome yeah. comeback story, like a Rocky two. <laughs> yeah. A Rocky three. Yeah, Rocky three. He got his title back from Mr. T. <laughs> cool. Well, I want to encourage everyone one more time. The book is called Bodybuilding, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. You can get it on gtool.com, G-T-O-U-L.com, or Amazon.com. And uh, thank you once again, Dr. Tuliados, for this great service that you provide to the uh, bodybuilders of the world who don't have very many people, especially medical professionals, to turn to for legitimate advice on what they're doing. And you're helping them do it in a safer, more efficient manner. So thank you very much. 
You're welcome. And everybody, thanks for watching. Ask Dr. Testosterone. Please keep the good questions coming, and we'll talk to you next time.